Good morning, Fellowship of the Hills. What a blessing it is to be with you this morning. And my prayer is, is that every time you enter the doors of this house, you will receive the message of Jesus Christ. For it is well with my soul. Amen. Amen. Well, you know, I have not been with you for several weeks. I was waiting for a little video of me to introduce me this morning, so I don't, I don't know what happened with that. But I do want to thank all of those who have stood in this sacred place to deliver God's Word to you in my absence. Next week, uh, you'll have the pleasure of uh, having Pastor Jerry Helton with you next Sunday as Susan and I will be on the road to Wichita, Kansas to spend time with our oldest daughter and uh, Larry, her husband, and three of our grandchildren. Uh, we were chatting the other night. It has been 15 years that's when Kean was born, our oldest grandson. It's been 15 years since we've spent Christmas with them. So thank you, church, for allowing us to be there. The message, that's what God has for us today. And as I begin this message, you're going to think, how in the world is he going to get to a Christmas theme where he starts with Adam? Bear with me. <laughs> this message actually came last Tuesday. I was sitting on the balcony as we were cruising uh, to Belize. And uh, as I was sitting there and looking at the beauty of God's creation, you all know I love the water. I love the mountains, but I love the water. There's just something peaceful of being out there. And as I was sitting there and, and reading the Word of God, and I was in Luke chapter 1, and I thought, well, the Lord was going to give me one of those messages for Christmas. You know, where we all know the story where Gabriel comes to Mary. We all know that story. About, we know about the message that was received from the angel to Mary and then to Joseph about Mary, this virgin who had found favor with God, who was going to have the Messiah. But the Lord took me all the way back to Genesis chapter 2. And I thought, the message title will be method, Message Received. How many of you have received messages? And you thought to yourself, is that something that I need to follow through with? How many of you have ever worked for someone? <laughs> Good. So you know where I'm going with this. If you have worked for someone, the boss or the CEO of the company will filter a message on how they want to run their company or what they want you to do, and that is filtered to a supervisor who is then bringing that message to the personnel, or in my case, to the troops. How many of you have ever been a supervisor? Have any of you ever heard a message from the boss that you didn't like? Now, whether you like it or not, it is your responsibility to get the message to your subordinates. Is that right? Yes. Now, you all know that if you don't like the message and you go to the subordinates and you go, because I've had this said to me before, well, I don't really agree with them, but this is what we have to do. Now, how far will that message go? You've depleted its value, right? Well, I'm here to tell you the message that God gives is always true. It is always pure. But there are sometimes the message gets twisted and gets devalued. So I went to back to Genesis chapter 2. When God created man, and his name was? Really, that's the best you can do? I've been gone for three weeks, and that's the best I get? His name was what? Good, there you go. So God created Adam, and in Genesis chapter 2, he tells Adam, he gives this beautiful garden to him, right? And he tells Adam, you can have it all. It's all yours except for this tree that's in the center, and the tree's name is what? Tree of, tree of life, right? The tree of good and evil. And God says, you can eat of anything, but don't eat from that tree, because the day that you eat of that tree, you will surely die. Well, then God gives gives Adam Eve. How many of you would say, thank God for Eve? I thank God for my lovely wife, Susan. What a blessing it's been to really spend some quality time with her. And she is happy to have me home. <laughs> she says, go spend time with somebody else. 
I smothered her. It was very expensive. But anyway, we had a wonderful time. <laughs> but a wonderful time. So, so there's Eve. And they're in the garden. And the serpent, who is really Satan, he comes to Eve and he says, Eve, Genesis chapter 3. Eve, did God surely say? Has anybody ever said that to you? Well, this is the message you received, but was it really meant that way? Did God surely say that if you eat from the tree, you will die? And then Eve responds, and then Satan comes back, and he twists it. And he says, well, let, let me tell you something. God doesn't want you to eat from that tree, because when you do, you're going to be just like him. You're going to have all wisdom and all knowledge. So what happened was, is the message got twisted. And you can only think, because we've been there, right? Well, did they really mean that, or did they mean this? So what did Eve and Adam do? They partook of the tree, and sin comes into the world. All of mankind becomes corrupted because they violated one simple message. Remember, God's message is always true, and it's always pure. Well, now here's something interesting. I, I continued to go through the Word of God in preparing this message, and I thought, I'm going to bring out some heroes of the faith. So I began to move through the Old Testament. How many of you remember Noah? God gave Noah a message, right? What did he tell Noah to do? To build an ark. Come on. Ark. All right, so, so Noah is out there. He's building ark. And the reason he's building ark is because God says, I've had it. I am done with all of this sin of mankind, and I'm going to destroy the world. And Noah, I want you to build this ark on dry land because it's going to rain. It's going to flood. So while Noah is building ark, do you think that others came to Noah and was giving him the message that he was crazy? Yes. You think that happened? Have any of you ever obeyed the Lord and people thought you were crazy? Yeah, it's happening today, right? So Noah's building this ark on dry land. And he's telling everyone, he's giving them the message, God is going to destroy the world. Get your heart right. Let me ask you a question. Is that happening today? Yes. You all know Jesus is coming back, right? Yeah, we celebrate that, man. We tell everybody, hey, listen, your time is limited. Jesus is coming back. And he's only going to receive those who have accepted him as what? Savior. So Noah preaches this message and he's built this ark. The whole time he's being really cool. But, Moses, or excuse me, but Noah listened to the message of God. And he builds the ark. And all of a sudden God says, it's time to go. And you know, Noah told that message to his family because all of his family was saved because they did what? They got in the ark. Praise God for that. He listened to the truth. He believed the message. If you go to that next slide, Jason. He believed the message. He acted on it. And what did he do? He shared it with his family. Isn't that what we're supposed to be doing? So I thought to myself, let me, let me go through some more places in Scripture. Y'all remember Moses, right? And God uses all kinds of messengers in his word. And that day, Moses heard from a burning bush. You remember that, that lesson I brought year, uh, months ago, right? I had this burning bush up here. It was kind of cool, right? So, so, so Moses is listening to the burning bush. And God speaking through the bush. And he tells Moses, you're going to be used by me to be my messenger to go to Pharaoh and tell him to let my people go. How many messages did Moses deliver to Pharaoh before Pharaoh finally listened? Ten. Ten. And it was the last message that actually cost Pharaoh his oldest son. And Pharaoh finally lets the people of Israel go. Now, what is also interesting in that, again, God uses all kinds of messengers to deliver his message. You'll remember that part as they were leaving. God told Moses to stand before the Red Sea and hold his staff up and command the sea to part. Well, Moses didn't have any power to do that, but God did. Listen, listen. Even the wind and the seas obey God's message. Amen? And the sea parted. Well, Pharaoh, we all know the rest of the story. Pharaoh got all bent out of shape because he let the people go. And through his rage and his anger, 
he followed and pursued them, and he subsequently got swallowed up along with his army in the Red Sea. Well, then we fast forward. How many of you have ever heard of this guy named Samuel? Samuel was a, who said prophet? Let's all say prophet. Samuel was a prophet. Now, he was sent by God to go to a man by the name of Jesse. Anybody know who Jesse was? Man, you guys are smart. It's like Bible trivia this morning. <laughs> so, so Jesse is David's father. Samuel goes to Jesse. He's been sent by God because Saul's kind of messing things up as the king. And the anointing of God is coming off of Saul. And God tells Samuel, I want you to go because you're going to anoint the next king of Israel. Go to Jesse's house because that's where you'll find the next king to anoint. So he goes to Jesse's home. Now Samuel's seven brothers happen to be there. Excuse me. David's seven brothers happen to be there. And David's out in the field watching the sheep. He's the youngest. Probably about 13, 14, 15 years old. Somewhere around that area. And while he is out tending the sheep, Samuel comes and he says, Jesse, bring your sons before me because God is going to select from your home the next king of Israel. I'm here to anoint that person. So all these strapping men, they march before Samuel. That's not him. That's not him. That's not him. Because God told him, he says, you're going to know which one it is. Don't select that person based upon their stature or their ability. You select that person based upon his heart. So as all these young men marched before Samuel, that's not the one. And he looks at Jesse, he says, Jesse, I've got a message to deliver from God to anoint the next king. Where's your other son? Do you have another one? He says, well, the young one's out there tending the sheep. We'll bring him in. And here comes this little fella. The word of God said he was handsome. Now, I don't know if God selects handsome men. I mean, after all. You know, I'm just kidding, right? So anyway, so, so the Word of God says he was handsome, right? And he had, his talent was music, right? But he was also tending sheep. He was a tough little kid. And <laughs> you can picture Jesse, all these tough guys, and that's the one. So Samuel anoints his young man to be the next king of Israel. Can you imagine being 13 to 15 years old and, and someone saying to you, God has selected you to be the next king of Israel? Well, we fast forward. The message was delivered. Amen? Now, I want you to hold on to that. The message was delivered to a young man who was told he'd be the next king. God had anointed him. Well, time goes on. It's about five years down the road. David is still tending sheep. His brothers are out with Saul and the rest of the Israeli army, and they're taking on the Philistines. Now, these are giant dudes. The biggest one in the Philistine army, his name was? Goliath. You guys are good. Goliath. You figure this, figure this guy's about 9, 10 feet tall, right? So he stands before the Israelites and he tells me, he says, hey, listen, if you can whip me, then the rest of us, the rest of the Philistines, we'll bow down to you. We'll worship you. You know, we'll, we'll hang out with you guys. But you got to pick your best one to come defeat me. Well, David is sent by his father, Jesse, to go check on the boys, See how things are going. Take them lunch while you go. So David gets there and he hears this conversation taking place between Goliath and the Israelis. And they're all hunkered down, scared to death. I mean, goodness, look at this big dude. Who, who among you is going to go and fight this guy? Not me. In fact, David says, why aren't you out there fighting? Well, we're scared to death. I love the message that David, as we fast forward, gives Goliath. David says to Goliath, I come to you in the name of the Lord, and today I'm going to beat you, and then I'm going to cut your head off. <laughs> now, Bible trivia, does anybody know why David made the point of saying to Goliath, I'm going to cut your head off? He had to have the head. But there's a reason behind that. You see... David would have lunch with his father and his brothers, and he would tell them about how he had fought the lion and the bear, and they would all laugh, say, sure you did, David, sure you did. And his dad says, well, if you really did, next time you bring his head. You want to prove you killed it? Take its head. How many of you got had heads hanging up in your house? <laughs> That's where that came from. 
So David defeats Goliath. Now, I want you to hold on to something. How is it that David could stand as a young boy, probably about 17 years old when he faced Goliath? How could he face Goliath when the rest of the army who were battled prepared soldiers? A young boy who had been fighting, taking care of the sheep, fighting the animals, keeping the animals away from the sheep. How did this little boy have the courage to face Goliath? God gave it to him. You know why? Because he believed in the message that was given to him years prior to that, that he was going to be the next king of Israel. How could he ever be king if he was killed? Are you listening to me, church? If God calls you to do something and he has anointed you to do it, don't be in fear of what's taking place today. Stand firm on the truth of God. I believe David stood firm on the truth of God because he had heard it and he believed it and he acted on it. Well, I could go on and on and on. How many of you would like me to do that this morning? (laughs) Two hands came up. That's great. That's wonderful. You said, well, pastor, we know you've been gone, but you don't need to fill in three weeks of messages in one service. Well, as I continue, I began to... Think about the very slide that I've given you this morning. I want you to let this soak in with the stories of truth that I just gave you from the Old Testament. You see, a messenger is the one that will bring you the truth. And it's the credibility of the messenger that gives credibility or credence or value to the very message that will be delivered. For example, the message that was given to David, it had credibility from the prophet and he believed it because its source was who? God. How many of you believe in this room today there are messengers of Jesus Christ? Absolutely. Absolutely. And if you believe in what Jesus came to do which was to provide salvation for you and for me, then should we not act on the message that we believe? And should we not share it with others? Well, I found myself in Malachi chapter 2, verse 7. Malachi 2, verse 7, it says, For the lips of the priest should guard knowledge, and people should seek instruction from his mouth, for he is the messenger of the Lord. You see, God has selected throughout this entire book, and I could, I could go on and on all day from the Old Testament to the New Testament and share with you the messengers that God chose to deliver his message. I'm thankful today that I could stand before you as one of the messengers that guards the truth of God's word. And I began to think of all the things that have happened in time. I remember the message that God gave when he created Adam and Eve. And he said that they'll be what? Male and female. Now, let me ask you a very simple question. How has Satan, how has he deluded, how has he uh, twisted that message today in the world in which we live? Uh, Well, the genders today, it's LGBTQXYZ. Uh, It's an alphabet soup. But God said his truth and the purity of his message, I'll create male and female. I began to think about Thanksgiving. How many of you loved turkey on Thanksgiving? Y'all love turkey? Uh, Susan and I weren't able to have turkey. We were at the hospital there at Hollywood Memorial. And uh, we were able to find a restaurant that was open after we were visiting her sister while we were in Fort Lauderdale. We found ourselves at the Red Lobster. The first, we made history that day. I had shrimp for Thanksgiving dinner. I said, Lord, never let this happen again. I love turkey. When my brother John and I were growing up, there were three meats in our house that were very popular. This is what we were used to. Uh, If it was, uh, if, if dad had done good that week in work, we could have ham. That was kind of the big deal. And then we had bologna. Yeah. Now, turkey, we would only have when it was left over from Thanksgiving. And I began to think about turkey. Now, listen, that's kind of interesting. Uh, Today, you can get turkey salami, turkey ham, and turkey bologna. Are you all following me on this? Somewhere, somebody gave the message that turkey could be anything it wanted to be. (laughs) 
Why can't the turkey just be happy being a turkey? (laughs) Do you understand the message that I'm bringing to you this morning? Things get twisted. And before long, we begin to believe the twisted, devalued message. I'm here to tell you that the message of Jesus Christ has never changed, and it will never change. Amen? That's my responsibility to you. That's your responsibility, that the message that we deliver is guarded in the knowledge of this book. So this morning, you're saying, where is he going in a Christmas message? Go to Luke chapter 1 with me. Luke chapter 1. How many of you know who Zechariah is? Zechariah is a priest. And if you would, please, follow along with me. We're not going to read the entire chapter, but I I do want to share with you a little bit about Zechariah. And I want you to see the message that Zechariah received and what he did with the message that he received. In Luke chapter 1, start with me, please, at verse number 5. You'll notice it's up on the screen for you, but I encourage you to open God's Word. Luke chapter 1, picking up at verse number 5. In the days of Herod, king of Judah, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah. And he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both, what church? Righteous before God. And they walked blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. Let's just pause there for a moment. How many of you in your home have this plaque that says, you know, in our house we serve the Lord? How many of you have that? Two of you. That's wonderful. Wonderful. I I thought it was kind of humorous last week when I was listening to Scotty's message, and he made a comment, and then he said, well, like seven of you raised your hand. You know, Pastor Marty would get on to you for that, right? How many of you listened to Scotty's message last week? I know when I did, I I was, man, I was crying. I felt sorry for myself last week in places of that message. (laughs) What a great message, Pastor Scotty. What great messages God has given you these past several weeks, amen? So so here is Zechariah. The Word of God says, as a priest, that he was what? Him and his wife Elizabeth were found blameless before God, and that they were obeying all of the statutes. It's important for you to remember that. They were found blameless before God. That means that they were men and women. They were a husband and wife of faith. God was at the center of their home. That's my prayer for each of you. That God is the center of your home. And as we continue the word of God, picking up at verse number six, and it says, and they were righteous before God, walking, blameless in the commandments and the statutes of the Lord, but they had no child. Why is it they had no child? Because what? Elizabeth was barren, which meant she could not have children. Then the next part says, and they were advanced in years. I love how the word of God says, now wait a minute, I want you to understand this. Before what is about to take place, you've got to grasp the scientific fact of this. Elizabeth could not have children. Are you with me, church? And there's another reason she couldn't have children. Not only because she was barren for all of those years, but she was now, ladies, if the Lord was to come to you today in your 60s and 70s, he said, today's the day. How many of you go, no, not now? (laughs) I love the Word of God, man. It it, it puts it to the point where we truly understand it. Elizabeth was barren. She couldn't have children, and she was advanced in years. So we know Zachariah is a man of God. We know that him and Elizabeth are old, and we know that they don't have children, and we know that they follow God. Now let's continue in the Scripture, picking up at verse number 11, please. And there appeared to Zechariah an angel, which is who? A messenger of God. And if you're a messenger of God, you come with the credibility because God is delivering a message through you. So you are the source of the message that God is going to deliver. So the angel is delivering a very important message to who? Zechariah. And appeared before him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him. Now, Zechariah, let me tell you where he was. If you go back to the verses before that, Zechariah's in the temple doing the things priests do. So the angel appears before him. And he says to him, do not be afraid. How many of you kind of be freaked out of an angel said, hey, just got to talk to you for a minute. (laughs) Whatever. (laughs) Don't be afraid, Zechariah. 
for your prayer has been heard. What prayer? Now, what prayer do you think Zechariah and Elizabeth had been praying for years? They want a child. And now she's been barren. Now she's old. How many of you pretty much said, that ain't going to happen? Right? Let me, have any of you ever prayed and don't believe in the prayer that you pray? Let me tell you something this morning. If you're going to pray it, it's worth believing it. Are you listening to me? If you're going to pray it, it's worth believing it. You say, well, pastor, that hasn't happened yet. Don't give up. Keep praying. Live by faith. So, again, she's barren. She's old. He's old, right? And, 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 and the angel says, Zechariah, your prayer has been heard. And your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. Now, listen to what John will be to Elizabeth and Zechariah. Wow, what a blessing this would, what a blessing this would be, parents, for you to understand that the children that you have are gifts from God, and they can be everything that God wants them to be, but are you willing to be the parent God has called you to be? Listen to what the angel says John will be. And you will have joy and gladness. Can I just pause there? How many of your children bring you joy and gladness? Man, that's great to see the hands in the house. Do you know your children are God's gift? And they should bring you joy and gladness by how you have raised them to love the Lord. John, John will bring you joy and gladness. And you will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great before the Lord. And he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled of the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. And verse 16 says, And he will turn away many children of Israel to the Lord. And he will go before him in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient of the wisdom of the justice to make ready the Lord's people to make ready for the messiah so so here is zachariah in the temple doing his priestly things an angel pops in and says hey zach listen your prayer has been answered you're going to have a boy i love it now let, let's go on let's go on verse number 18 and zachariah said to the angel now, come on, I know you'd have done this too. How shall I know this? In other words, how are you going to make this happen? In other words, I doubt this. How is this going to be so? For I am an old man. I'm glad he started there and didn't say, I want you to know Elizabeth's old. <laughs> he didn't start there. He he says to the angel, I want you to know I'm old. And then he threw his wife under the bus. <laughs> angel, I'm old. I, don't, I, I, I doubt this because I'm old. And by the way, in case you forgot, <laughs> Elizabeth's old too. <laughs> now, anybody ever doubted what God can do? Be honest with me. How many of you have been praying? You've been praying and you've been praying you pretty much just given up. Maybe God doesn't hear you. How many of you believe God's timing is always perfect? Maybe he's waiting. Maybe he's watching you, seeing where your faith is at. The question, Zach says, is but how? I'm old and she's old. Verse number 19. You know, the angels have got a response to this, right? And the angel said to Zach, I am Gabriel. In other words, he's bringing clarity, he's bringing clout, he's bringing what? Credibility. He said, I want you to know I am Gabriel. And I stand in the presence of God. You know what? Maybe I need to start every message and say, I am Marty and I stand in the presence of God. Isn't that true? 
Malachi said that if I bring you the message, I'm going to bring it from the knowledge of what God has given through the power of the Holy Spirit to deliver that message to you. Amen? So Gabriel brings credibility, and he says this is where the source of this message comes from. I already told it, but I want to make sure you truly understand it. I'm Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this what? Good news. You're going to have a boy. Well, verse number 20 takes us in a direction because Gabriel's not done. And behold, I want you to pause for a moment. Think about this. What should have Zach done when he had received the message from Gabriel at the beginning? What? What? Man, he should have been jumping up and down saying, Lord, you've answered my prayer. We old, but we're going to have a boy. Amen? But no. Here was a man of God that was found blameless, a man of God that was following the statutes and the commandments of the Lord. That's why he started off with that. But yet he was a man, even in his faith at that moment, there was a lapse of faith and he doubted God. Has anybody ever been there? Anybody ever been there? You know, when you doubt, notice that line I've got for you there. In that moment that you doubt, there's a price. Amen? Gabriel could have said, well, you know what? Since you've doubted, forget it. It's over. But he didn't do that. But there was a price for Zachariah's doubt. And we see that in this next verse as the angel continues. And behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place. Because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in time. You see, it was a momentary step outside the natural box where God is. You see, God is in the supernatural, and we find ourselves, if you'll show the next slide, well, I, want you, I want you to just ask yourself, have you ever been there? Have you ever been in what I call the natural human box of thinking? You see, God doesn't operate there. You know that, right? I want you to understand this. When you're praying, when you're listening to the message of God, when you're waiting for the message of God, understand this. God does not operate in your box where you keep him in your human, natural, scientific thinking. God's in the supernatural realm. That's where he's at. If you want to see things happen, then you reach outside of your human thinking and believe what? All things are possible with God. I mean, didn't Paul say that? Philippians 4, 13, what did he say? I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. He said all things are possible with him. So the price that Zechariah was going to have to pay at that time for not believing and having faith in the prayer that he'd been praying, that now he's going to have a son, the price was that he's going to be quiet. He can't speak. Speak. How, how many of you wives would love for maybe the angel to do that one day, dear? So, 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 so now while he's, in, he's coming out of the temple and, and all the people want to know what had just happened in there, he couldn't say a word. He asked for talent. Well, about nine months, poor Zachariah can't say a thing. All of his communication now has taken place on tablets. Now, I'm going to tell you what, he didn't have a big pen or a paper mate back then to write with. He didn't have an iPhone where he could text people, all right? Silent. And then the scripture goes on. Notice this. Now, we all believe that when God says something's going to happen, it's going to happen, right? Because the word of God is true. It's pure. Verse 24. And these days his wife Elizabeth conceived... And for five months, she kept herself hidden. And now the time came for Elizabeth to give birth, and she bore a son. And we slide on down to verse number 59. And on the eighth day that they came to circumcise the child, and they would call him Zechariah to be named after his father. But his mother said, no, he shall be called John. Verse 61 says, and, and they said to her, none of your relatives is called by this name. You see, because back at that time, you would name your son, your firstborn son, after what? 
Well, after the Father, right? And, and, the, and the people were saying, well, wait a minute, there's nobody else called John. Uh, why would you do this? And they made signs to the Father. Poor Zach's over there. <laughs> right? I love it. And they said to her, none of your relatives is called by this name. And they made signs to the Father inquiring what he should be called. And he asked for a writing tablet. <laughs> Do you all see the humor in this? <laughs> mm. And he asked for a writing tablet. His name is John. That's what he wrote on the tablet. And they all wondered, well, why is that? Verse 64, notice this. And immediately Zachariah's mouth was opened, and his tongue was loosed, and he spoke blessings of God. The message, the pure message that came from the angel, from the source, which was God, was spoken in truth. And everything God said would happen, happened. John was born. You see, John now was going to be used as a messenger too, right? Y'all know that, right? Because what did the angel tell Zechariah that his son would do? Prepare the way for the Lord. Can I ask you a question? Because in just a moment, I'm going to share a few verses about John. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. But how many of you have received the message of Jesus Christ? How many of you have believed the message of Jesus Christ? How many of you have acted on the message of Jesus Christ? And how many of you have shared the message of Jesus Christ? John was born. And there was a promise made about John's life. And we turn to Luke chapter 3. In Luke chapter 3, verses 2 and 3, and then I'm going to pick up at 15, 16, and 18, it says, During the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of who? Zechariah, in the wilderness. And he went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming and baptizing of the repentance for the forgiveness of sin. What did, what did God say that John would be doing? Be leading the people of Israel to who? To the Lord. I need to pause here for a moment. Parents, listen to me. Are you preparing your children for the way of the Lord? Are you letting the world do it? Are you letting TikTok do it? Are you letting YouTube do it? Susan and I went out uh, this past week. We made a visit over in Gainesville, and we went to a new pizza place. It was a weird name, Mod Pizza. It's actually pretty good. And while we were sitting there, a couple came in with their child. And Susan and I were eating our pizza, and I looked over, and I nudged Susan and said, honey, take a look at that. Mom and dad were on their phone, and their son was on their phone. No communication whatsoever. And I thought to myself as I was reflecting on the message that God has for today, what a beautiful message for a parent to get about their child. And I'm here to tell you, parents, you can have that message if you'll raise your children the way God wants you to raise them and quit letting the world do it. Everything that God said that child was going to do, now as a man, he was doing it. And it says that he was leading people to Christ. Verse number 15 as the people were in expectation and all their questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Christ, some of them thought John was the Messiah. What did John do? John said, that's not me. John answered in verse number 16, John answered them saying, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming. The strap of his sandals I am not fit to wear. He will baptize you with the power of the Holy Spirit and with fire. And verse number 18 says, so with many other exhortations, John preached the good news to the people. Let me ask you a question. 
Is the message of God pure? Is the message of God true? Again, we all know the story. We all know the Christmas story, right? Mary would birth Jesus, who would be the Messiah. You go back into the Old Testament, some incredible books I love to read, from Isaiah to Hosea. Incredible books prophesying of the coming of Christ. When those prophecies were given, was God telling the truth that he was going to send a Messiah? Yes or no? And what was the purpose of the Messiah? The purpose of the Messiah was to take away the sin of mankind. You see, the only reason Jesus came is we come to celebrate his birth. The only reason, I want you to understand this, bar none, the only reason Jesus came was to go to the cross. That's it. Oh, my goodness, for three years he did some incredible miracles. And, and I know there are so many that's not recorded in the Word of God. We can only grasp those things that were given to us. But so many other things happen in the ministry of Christ. But his only purpose for his birth was to be nailed to a tree that he created. Think about that. The very tree that Jesus was nailed on came from his creation. And Jesus shed his blood for you and for me. To do what? To pay the sin debt that was caused way back in Genesis chapter 3 when God told Adam and Eve that if you eat of that tree, you will surely die. Sin brings upon us death. Not only physical death, but spiritual death, a separation from God. Jesus came to bring us life. Now, I have just showed you through the Word of God, just scratching the surface about the source of the message that God gives. And as the source, there's credibility in it, yes or no, church? And if there's credibility in it, then that means when we hear it, we should believe it. We should act on it, and we should share it. This morning, if you're in this house, and you have never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, now I'm not saying this for Marty, okay? I'm saying this as a holder of the knowledge of God's Word. This is what it says. If you have not received Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, you are dead in your sin. You're dead in your sin. Your only hope is believing in the message of what Jesus came to do. John prepared the way he told them. Jesus continued when he ascended to heaven as he told his disciples. He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel baptizing them in the name of Jesus Christ. And you think to yourself when they heard that message, the world? How are we going to tell the world? Just, there's just us. From those disciples to where we are today, millions have heard the message of Jesus Christ. Millions have believed and received the message of Jesus Christ. Millions have acted on the message of Jesus Christ in their faith. And millions have shared the message of salvation. If you haven't received Jesus Christ today as your Lord and Savior, you're right there where you're sitting. Jesus is knocking on your heart's door. And he's saying, today's the day. Today's the day. Today is the day that you can believe and call on me to be your Savior because I came for you. In a moment, we're going to bow our heads. And by bowing our heads, I want us to show reverence to the Lord this morning. The deacons and the elders are going to come and we're going to partake of that Last Supper.
today's the day of salvation for you. For those of you that have received Jesus Christ, we're at the Christmas season, the birth of Christ. Wonderful celebration. The birth of our Savior. How many of us are acting and sharing the good news? How many of us are sharing what Jesus Christ did in our life? It's one thing to believe it. It's another thing to act on it. And it's another thing to share it. Will you pray with me? Father, the greatest message that have, has ever been given to mankind. No greater message but this message. The greatest message was that Jesus Christ was born. Prophesying that the Messiah has come. And then, Father, 33 years later, throughout the course of the ministry of my Savior, as he was in that upper room with his disciples, he was sharing with them that his time had come. And after they had eaten, Jesus had picked up the bread and he broke it. And he passed it out to each one of them. And he said, this is my body. It's given for you. And in that same manner, Jesus, he took the cup. And he passed it to each of them. And he said, this is my blood. As a payment for the remission of your sins. Drink, drink all of it. Take all of me in. For today I will set a new covenant. I am the Lamb of God. I am the way of your salvation. And with that, Jesus would go to the cross. Emmanuel, God with us, Jesus would go to the cross, allowing the soldiers to nail his hands and feet, bearing all the pain that humanly could be tolerated. As Isaiah said, he took the stripes for our healing, for the healing of sin. He took all of the pain and all of the agony that sin causes for you and for me. And Jesus, as he was on that cross, as he looked at the crowd that at one time yelled, crucify him. In his human pain, as he was taking the weight of our sin. Jesus said, forgive them, Father. Forgive them. You see, that's what Jesus is saying to you this morning. Jesus is saying, I forgive you. Take me. I paid that sin debt for you. Take me. I went to the cross for you. Take me. Today is the day of your salvation. If you're here today and you've accepted Christ as your Savior, are you sharing that news with others? Are you sharing the greatest story that John was sharing and preparing the way? You see, because we as Christians are preparing the way for the second coming of Christ. Are you preparing the way? Are you telling others about the good news, about the salvation, about the forgiveness, about the hope and the love and the mercy and the grace that Jesus has given you. What are you doing with the greatest message that was ever given? In Jesus' name, all God's people said, amen. amen.